Slightly funny question, Jeremy, but did you grow up wanting to be an MP? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I, um, I grew up um, exploring lots of things, lots of ideas and the countryside where we lived. and. Because um, you were born, you're, you're not a city boy. No, 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 no. no. We were born in a little village in Wiltshire, um, which was just outside Chippenham. I was the youngest of four, and um, by the time I came along, my parents had done it all, seen it all, and so on. So I got an incredibly liberal upbringing. They kind of left you alone. Yeah. 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 Nothing happened to the other three. It probably won't happen to him. Mm -hmm. And so um, I um, had the... I mean, it was these days, you know, social services would be called. Mm -hmm. I was sort of allowed to go wandering off around the village on my own at five years old. Really? Just <laughs> walk off. And said, oh, you'll come back. And there was no traffic. There was. And you were into nature and yeah, yeah. wandering. And I remember um, my brothers and my mum and dad were all in the house and I was in the garden. And um, there was a stone wall which really needed a bit of work doing on it. And it had um, lots of gaps between the stones. And I'm looking at there and there's a snake in the wall. And I'm absolutely fascinated by this snake. It's so I'm looking like this. So I go in the house and say, there's a snake in the garden. They said, no, there isn't. I said, well, how do you know? I've just seen it. So they said, OK. What did it look like? I said, well, it was long. <laughs> Snakes are. I was five years old. And um, they said, well, what did it look like then? And so one of my brothers then started drawing a snake. And he said, did it have these V marks on it? Oh. I said, yeah. He said, Adder? It's an adder. Yeah. So I'm, sitting, I'm standing there look, looking at this adder coming right up to my face. It never stung me, never bit me. Well, I learned to avoid snakes. Yeah, you learned to avoid snakes. Uh, uh, right. that's, that's a neat segue. At an early age. So, so will you just tell us how you became political? How did that Well, be? Um, I was very unsuccessful academically in school, but there was two things I enjoyed, was reading history and looking at atlases. So I would look at maps of the world a lot, and that gave me this sort of interest in our globe. And um, the history we taught was probably not very adequate, but my mother, without really pushing, was actually much more interested in social history and um, political history that went with that. And so when it came to me doing A-levels, which I was allowed to do despite having not enough O-levels. I had to take some extra ones because you know, exams, exams and me never got along very well. And um, I then looked and saw they had this uh, <clears throat> paper called Russia in the Era of Revolution. I said, oh, I'll do that one then. Mm. So it was History of Russia from 1860 to 1920. It was fascinating. And you got really absorbed in that. It was, I did very yeah. badly in the exam because yeah. I, I probably answered two questions at great length and didn't bother with the rest. Mm. Um, so I then wrote to the um, Soviet Union embassy saying, I'm studying Russian history. Have you got any books? Really? <laughs> So they sent this great parcel of books. I've still got them. That's very obliging of them. Well, I suppose it was, really. Yeah. Maybe they were a bit surprised to get such a request. It was very nice of them. So I had those. Um, some of them were not terribly well written, but I read a lot of other stuff as well. And that was an interest. But also, um, six, 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I was sort of like... Um, in a minority of one in my school in discussing it. They're all saying, well, come on, it's Russia's fault, Newcomb, you know. It was that kind of mad stuff. Yeah. I think that's crazy. So I then became involved um, at a distance in CND. There wasn't any CND activities locally. And so I was end endlessly having to argue my case because once you've... This a, is sixth form. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't quite sixth form then, no, wouldn't it be 62? No, it wouldn't be sixth form then. Mm. Um, you have to argue your case. And once you've said, you know, I'm against nuclear weapons, mm. you've then got to develop your argument. Mm. And you've got to then look for the arguments. There was no internet. You've got to start thinking things through. And so um, I grew up in this sort of um, minority of one political position in my school most of the time. So that's kind of an early... Precursor. I've done for a while, actually. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it was... Um... And then did you think, OK, I want to get more involved in this, more yeah, involved in anti-nuclear yeah, yeah, things, yeah. come to London? Is that... Yes, I did. I came to some demonstrations in London when I was a little bit older. And then I was away for a couple of years after I left school in the Caribbean and Latin America. Then I came to, then I had I came to London after that. Um, I had various jobs in the Midlands again, different sort of jobs, um, farm factories. Um, I tried a bit of journalism and this and that, yeah. and then ended up coming to London. What late twenties? No, it would be early twenties. So, so I came around here. Right. Hitchhiked down to London. And the truck from GKM Sankey gave me a lift all the way. Me and the driver are chatting, and um, then we're going along the Holloway Road. And I said, where are we? He said, London. I said, yeah, we've been in London for quite a while, but because it's a long journey. And I said, um, where do you want me dropped off, Sandy? I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the docks. I said, oh, OK. So we're going along the Holloway Road, and I saw this road sign said Ronald's Road. I said, drop me here. Really? I just and you didn't name. know anyone here? No. And you didn't have somewhere to stay? Found somewhere. You found somewhere. Hmm. So really, your earliest and continuing kind of experience of London has been this area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and so um, I then have always lived, um, ever since then, around um, Hackney, Islington, Haringey. Right. So uh, my first uh, bed sit I got was on Wilberforce Road in Finsbury Park. And a lot cheaper than bed sits are now. Oh, well, it was, I mean, it never felt like it at the time, yeah. but you could go into a newsagent shop, look at the cards and get a bed sit and move in that yeah, day. Yeah. So you were Labour, your family was Labour, yeah. obviously, and you came here. And then what made you think, I want to do this well, locally? My mum and dad were both in the Labour Party. They'd met in the 1930s supporting the Spanish Republic yeah. in the Civil War and um, anti-fascist activities in London and so on. Um, they, my dad was probably more active in the party th than my mum was. They, I don't remember a whole lot of Labour Party activity. I was very small, but maybe that my dad was working away from home a lot because we lived in Wiltshire and he wor he worked in. English Electric in Stafford a lot of the time, so you know he was away most of the week. Um, later on, they became much more active. Now I become active uh, in Shropshire. I was in the Young Socialists. I went to Young Socialist conferences and so on, and then I came here and I was active in Hornsey Labour Party, just right. up the road from where we are now in New Beacon Books. So in fact, yeah. it's in this constituency. Yeah. And um, then um, I was. Um, asked to be agent for a council by-election, which a friend of mine was a candidate in, and we put an enormous effort into this council by-election and got a huge turnout and massive swing, etc., etc. It was a great result. Yeah. Fantastic. Len Silverstone, 1972. And then I was then the agent for Hornsey Party, and then I was, again, um, I was, I felt the Labour Party was getting too far away from the communities it represented or sought to represent. And um, I got involved in a big campaign in the streets where this shop is now mm. to prevent them being demolished. Right. The council, a Labour council, wanted to demolish them all and make it into a um, concrete housing estate. Most of the houses were council owned already. The residents didn't want that. A lot of us didn't want that. We wanted rehabilitation and preservation yeah. of the community. So we mounted this campaign and I was then selected um, as the Labour candidate for this ward against the chair of the Redevelopment Committee. Oh, right. So an so early fight. An early fight. And we won that one. I was selected as a, as a candidate, one of the three candidates. And we, a lot of arguments in the party, but I insisted that um, we fight the campaign on rehabilitation, not demolition, in mm. this ward. Big stress in the Borough Labour Party. But anyway, we, we won. We got elected. And um, then the first Labour group meeting, I was threatened with removal of the whip for opposing the council policy on a, a demolition of Woodstock, Ennis and Stroud Green Road. And what happened, though? What actually... Well, there are a lot of paper tigers. Um, uh, I went to the inquiry, gave evidence in support of the residents. It went to a public inquiry, was, was, was at it. And we eventually won the public inquiry and the council was forced to rehabilitate, not Gosh. demolish. So it was a 
great so vic was fantastic that an early victory. lesson or did that just feel like I continuation of what you'd always done which was being was the a, kind of only one in the room a um, bit of both yeah um it was a lesson in the um, way in which people in elected office can be over influenced by the officials around them yeah uh, many of the councillors didn't really want to demolish the roads, yeah. but they, they, they'd been told there was no alternative. They'd been given a lot of nonsense about the condition of the property and so on, all, all the sort of arguments that go on. Um, and we managed to mobilise the residents, and I became great friends with um, a Tory voting Polish refugee called Helena Fodorowicz, who had come out of the Warsaw Ghetto, lovely woman. Um, she was actually, I think she was a Tory, but I got on fine with her and uh, it was lovely. We unveiled a memorial stand. Was she one of the residents yeah. whose homes She was the key one because yeah. we won it because she is, she, her house was the only one in that row that was not owned by the council. Mm. So they had to put a compulsory purchase order on her property. Mm. And her line was, uh, I said, Elena, are you kind of worried about this? We chucked Hitler out of Poland. We'll chuck this lot out of here. <laughs> oh, she was. She didn't care. Yeah. You know, as far as she was concerned. And it was a couple of years ago. Her family contacted me because they were trying to put piece together stuff of her life, and said, "Can you tell us your memories of her?" No. Oh. Because she must have died quite a while oh, ago. A long time ago. Yeah. She died a long time. Yeah. We got a memorial stone to her in the park, which is lovely. Yeah. So you did. It feels as if it's going to be one of those natural progression stories. Political youth, um, an early toughness about this is what I think and I'll stand up to everyone. Have that battle over in a neighbouring area, become a local councillor, win a big battle, mm. and we're on to becoming standing for the local, be a mm. local MP. Does it? Is that right? Is that how it Not feels? Not really, because it, it's, you make it sound like it was almost a grand plan. No, no, not a grand plan, but a natural, organic progression yeah, out yeah. of your I, policy. Yeah, I guess, as, yeah, if, if you look at it in that way, I suppose it is. Um, Islington North was then going through um, big um, problems because the MP at that time was Michael Halloran for Islington uh, North. SDP. Did he and go into he, it? Yeah. Indeed, he did. And John Grant was the MP for Islington Central. And George Cunningham was the MP for Islington South. They all defected the SDP. Yeah. Um, they, uh, many councillors also defected. So the place went from being a solidly Labour borough into an SDP borough right. almost overnight. And um, the Labour Party were... There was already a big battle going on in Islington North between those that wanted more democracy in the party and O'Halloran and his friends who had a different view of the world, shall we say. And um, I was, um, I'd been helping the left in the party in the past because they weren't, there, were, there was some argument, I don't quite know what the reason for the argument was, that the people who were running council election campaigns, if they weren't supporters of O'Halloran, were not allowed to use the Labour Party facilities, even though they were candidates. I mean, it was, it's absurd, really. And so I gave them facilities in Hornsey, just up the road, when I was the agent. So we built up a friendship with a lot of people there. Then O'Halloran resigned from the Labour Party, so that was then an open field for selecting a new candidate. And they asked me if I would be prepared to have yeah. my name put forward, and I thought about it. My mum advised against it on the basis that MPs are all a bit strange. Do you really want to get mixed up with those people? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm strictly making no comment. At no, that yeah, point. I'm not asking you to make a comment. <laughs> and uh, she said, but if you want to do it, that's up to you kind of thing. But she said, you know, there's some very strange people in that place. You know, I said, how do you know? She said, well, I read about it. <laughs> so anyway... But but I'm just thinking now, if you stand to be an MP, there's a great worry about, you know, the attacks and it's a toxic atmosphere. It wasn't like that then, was it? I mean, you were going into a gentleman's club. I mean, you well, or is that is that not right? Did it no, not? It didn't feel like it at the time. What? Remember, social media has changed perceptions a lot. There was yeah. no social media. Um, 
So I put my name in. Yeah. Was um, maybe I'll come back to it, but I was eventually selected as the candidate. O'Halloran then stood as an independent. Right. Um, in the election, um, and the election was uh, my selection was narrow, but I was selected. Um, the NEC had a vote on whether I should be endorsed or not because Shirley Williams and those that later fully defected then um, voted against my selection. And so I did get selected and endorsed by the NEC, but a lot of people thought I wouldn't be endorsed. Right. And right. I was. And then we had the um, into the election campaign itself. Which and that was, was 80, 83. 83 election. So right in the kind of the height and of Thatcherism? Yes. Well, again, looking back, it was. But at the time, you don't always feel that because I'd been involved in um, left politics from the... Well, from forever, really. And I was a union organiser in the 70s, yeah. particularly during the end of the Labour government, the big strike, 78, 79. And then we lost the 79 election. We then had all this activism in the Labour Party, including supporting Tony for deputy leader. I was very involved in that. Um, we didn't. We just missed on winning that. At the time, we thought, this is a progression. We'll do even better in the future. Mm. We didn't appreciate this was the high point. Yeah, yeah. And we then went into um, the election of 83, which we lost, um, immediately followed by the miners' strike. And so what the Tories were doing was actually an incredibly well thought out plan, all going right back to Keith Joseph during the period of the Labour government when he basically set out a Tory vision of society that was light years different to the um, One Nation Tories of the past. Mm. And so we were then moving into a sort of vicious era yeah. of neoliberal economics being imposed on the poorest people, huge fight back by the miners and other communities, and the failure by the Labour Party leadership and the TUC leadership to recognise the fundamental nature of the attack that was taking place. They kept on thinking, well, there's actually a lot of moderate Tories around. They won't push this thing through. I remember some of these discussions that um, Tony and I were having with Labour MPs during the miners' strike who, who just either didn't want to or didn't get how fundamental the attack was. Well, can we nail a myth about Islington North? Because if you... There's, there's lots a, of myths. Which one? Oh, well, the, well <laughs> uh, the myth that, you know, during all debates, it's like you represent Islington North or a constituency like it, you're therefore representing the wealthy South. And, you know, this that's it's just no, not bad. a true... It, it, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. This argument that somehow or other there is an intrinsically wealthy south of England and an intrinsically poor north yeah. of England and that somehow or other a place labelled Islington is automatically full of um, wealthy um, wealthy people, fast-growing community of yuppies, etc. Yeah. It's nonsense. Yeah. 45% of the children are living in relative poverty yeah. in the constituency now. There is a huge level of housing stress. There's a huge mental health I issue and problem. And uh, all the estate agent hype about Islington is essentially all concentrated around a quarter of the population. Yeah. Um, Which is the, 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 the owner-occupiers owner in around, what, sort of <clears throat> hybrid in Islington? Well, 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 I don't know where it is. occupation is um, spread out. Yeah. And... It's changed. There was a time when owner occupation was working class owner occupation in this area. In Andrea Levy's wonderful book about this island, um, it talks about how the family put together to buy a house in this area and um, because they could afford to do so. Yeah. So there was a lot of shared ownership of families coming together to buy a house yeah. and things like this. Um, but now what happens is if a family own a house and family grows up, somebody passes on and so on, they sell it. So large families move out yeah. or, and sell to a smaller, wealthier family. Yeah. In the council housing, it's the other way around. Yeah, interesting, yeah. And so it's um, large, poorer families move in to council places and wealthier small families move into owner occupation. So, the divide has got bigger. I was going to say, do you feel that divide yes. as the MP? The you time. see that all the that time. you're. And are there families 
that you have known over 40 yeah. years. Yeah. So many, uh, many families that I've sort of known for many years with their different issues on housing, school places, college places, work-related stuff, and so on. So you, you kind of get to know them. And people say, oh, yeah, you, um, you know, my granny said you helped her get her place in 1983. Now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you can't obviously remember all of it, but and um, the notebooks I've kept of the casework I've been doing and so on are like a social history of the yeah. place. It's a kind of social history of the issues people faced and the um, brutality of the Home Office in its treatment of um, families and family separation, which has got worse, if anything. Yeah. And so there's a lot of, a lot of my casework was related to either housing or refugees and migrants. We had a, in those days, in the, you described as the Gentleman's Club of Parliament in the 80s, if somebody arrived in this country and was threatened with um, non-admission or deportation as an asylum seeker or anything else, an MP phoning up was enough to put a stop on the removal yeah. until representations could be made. And it didn't have to be the constituency MP. Any MP could do it. <clears throat> so there was a crisis in Sri Lanka. A lot of Tamil people were seeking asylum um, outside of um, Sri Lanka and they would turn up in Britain and be they would attempt to remove them straight away and so the Tamil community came to me and said can you help and I said of course and so um, we then set up a system where we would deal with the case put in the representations and the government then realized that there were a small number of MPs, about a dozen of us, I think, who were taking what they called an excessive number of Tamil cases. Yeah. And we had a system with a lovely volunteer, um, Italian guy who was, um, had been industrially injured, so couldn't work, but he was a volunteer in my office and helped, Michael Cavelli. Um, and his job and he took it very seriously, was to make sure the documents got there in time. So he'd turn up at the Home Office at midnight, banging on the door, and he wouldn't leave or stop banging on the door until they'd received the papers and signed a receipt to bring back to me. Mm -hmm. We managed to prevent a lot of people being yeah. deported, but that was the start of the rot. And we now have a position where there are refugees around here mm -hmm who have no money at all. What can you do for them as well, an MP? Well, we have a council unit called No Recourse to Public Funds who are doing their very best. We arrange, if possible, charitable support and so on like that, and then fight the case for their right to remain in this country. Mm. But we have a desperate underclass mm. here and all over Europe of people who are victims mm. of wars that we created. Mm. And so I'm now a member of the Council of Europe delegation. I'm on the Migration Committee and I've now persuaded them to do a special report around Calais and the treatment of um, people that are trying to get from Calais to Britain. I've met them in Calais. They're just desperate, desperate mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. from Afghanistan, Iraq, yeah. Syria, Libya. Where have we been in war? Yeah, yeah. And so it's the human element in the campaigning we've got to do. Yes, it's changed, yeah. but the principles have not. But also I'm thinking that every MP sort of creates their own relationship with the constituency, don't they? Mm. And constituency work is therefore a really crucial part of being an it's MP. About, it's not about me being a superhuman being. I'm not. It's not me about me being a super caseworker. I'm not. It's about promoting enabling and empowering people. Yeah. That is what politics ought to be about. I don't want a, a, a transactional patronising relationship. No, because that's between... kind of charitable. That's charitable. Yeah. Work. I don't do charitable. Do you work. see different people. kinds of MPs, though? I mean, you must have seen all sorts. Oh, okay. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, Where I do mean, I start? Yeah, I know. I don't, I, I, I don't want to get into uh, sort of... Uh, no, no, I don't do personality uh, No, no, we, we, we don't do that. That's the basic rule. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I... I, I, I it's just it's my experience from you know my own childhood and seeing things that there's a particular kind of constituency MP that is very dedicated. It's quite a demanding job, but takes the themes that they're facing in the constituency 
and takes those to the heart of politics. I mean, that's what it's for. That's yeah. what you're for, isn't it? Yeah. To make the case in Parliament, make the case in select committees. Mm. Yeah, and it's uh, working with people to achieve um, change in the area. Now, some MPs, the first day in Parliament is really... Um, yeah, what was that like, your first day in Parliament? It was a weird Parliament? experience, because I, I walked in there. I didn't really know very many people at all. Um, and I noticed a lot of newly elected MPs of all parties seem to know each other. That's a, so I said to him, I said, how come so many of you know it? Oh, we all met at Oxford. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Where did you go? What, said, Labour and Tory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they said, well, where did you go? I said, didn't go anywhere. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's that. And then you feel them getting sucked in mm. because it is a quite a daunting experience and quite a change. You suddenly... You put into Parliament. It's a very grand building. Yeah, seems a million miles away from the rest of the world, and it is, and it's probably designed to be like that. And it can appeal, appear, and uh, appeal to people who have vanity to problems, and they love it. So you see the change in people. Do you really see it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You see some people who change very, very quickly. Some take longer to change and some don't change at all. But it is also what you do as a member. Like explain that first day. So I'm I knew Joan Maynard, um, and a Labour MP for Sheffield for Brightside. And um, she'd been a former farm worker and member of the National Executive, lovely, wonderful woman in every way. And so, and with Harry Cohen, so we go into the tea room and she said, let's have some tea. So we bring over a pot of tea and put out the cups. I put out the cups and start pouring. So, no, Jeremy, that's my job. She was, she was real no-nonsense. So she, um, so she, uh, starts pouring the tea out okay so she's quite stern she says right Harry and Jeremy you're both new MPs aren't you I said that's right Joan have you got any advice she said I've got one piece of advice for you what's that Joan she said look when you're sitting there on the back benches and you find that the both front benches are agreed on something the working class are losing out <laughs> Just remember that, and you know which side you're on. Did you apply that rule over the Absolutely. years? Absolutely. She said, that was, I thought, the greatest piece of wisdom. And then a few weeks later, I brought my mum into Parliament to see it. She came, she went to the gallery, walked around, saw her everywhere and so on and so on, tea and terrace and everything. And then I go to the station with her to go home. She's going home. And um, then she says to me, very nice, dear, very nice. When are you going to get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that always her attitude? Yeah. She said, you know, you're there to serve the people. Let's say a 15-year-old girl in your constituency is watching this and she thinks I'm really interested in politics and I feel passionate, but it's, 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 it's not always that easy to stand up to the powers that be. Mm. And I was just thinking about when, say, take key votes in Parliament, like the vote against the invasion of Iraq in 2003, mm. or going against the Labour front bench on austerity in 2010. Mm. What's, what helps you to say, you know what, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you knew what you thought, you were against it. I've heard other MPs who were being sort of um, lobbied by you know, Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell and all the rest of it, absolute agony. What helped you to keep clear and defiant at votes that really mattered to you? Was it having <clears throat> the campaign group around you? Is it your years of experience? Does that question make sense? Because I want yeah. that 15-year-old young <clears throat> woman to feel, well, I could do that yeah. and not give in. Um, you have to be prepared to be unpopular. Right. You have to be uh, prepared... Um, to have a hard time, and you don't have to obsess yourself with career progression in the future. Right. If you go into Parliament on the basis that you're always going to be popular, 
and you will automatically go through some kind of career progression yeah. and become somebody very famous and very important later on, you will trim on everything. Yeah. You will trim your views and you won't stand up when you should. Um, and then you've got to ask yourself the question, what was I elected here for? Mm. Was I elected here to cut people's living standards, to cut wages and all those kind of things, or was I elected here to do something different. So you have to be prepared to be unpopular. And you were always clear about that. <clears throat> Very clear. And uh, prepared to make myself unpopular. I mean, I started off with a um, massive argument about Ireland in that I, within a couple of weeks of being elected, I was supportive of the view there had to be talks with Sinn Féin. Mm. There had to be talks with the Irish Republican movement if it was ever to be any kind of um, end to this ghastly issue of the troubles in the war in Northern Ireland. And so I invited Jerry Adams to come to Parliament. He, he'd been elected but wasn't going to take his seat. So I invited him to come to a meeting in Parliament um, and he'd been at the GLC with Ken Livingstone. So I, I got threats from just about everybody we'll take the whip off you if you go ahead with this meeting, you cannot do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the Daily Mail and Daily Express all got onto the case, as you'd expect, and the Sun, of course. And um, the meeting went ahead, it happened, and they were sort of on my case about Ireland from then onwards. And um, there is a very big Irish community around here who yeah. were supportive of my view that there had to be some kind of process that would bring about changes in Northern Ireland. And so I learned very quickly just how brutal the press and, and everything can be. And then when we took up the Guildford Four campaign, one of the Guildford Four, Paul Hill, lived in the community. And um, the abuse I received was phenomenal. Yeah. You could paper the walls of my house with yeah. the threatening letters I got. And I've so, got to ask you, did you find that difficult? <laughs> Well, you got used to it after a while, a bit like your dad. You yeah. just get used to it. I mean, I remember Tony, after he'd stopped being an MP, comes into the tea room because he was given freedom of the building. And um, I'm sitting down with, I think, John McDonnell and somebody else having a cup of tea. And Tony comes busting in, puts his tray down with his usual tea appalling and taste of with a banana and Mars bar and a cup of tea, or, or, you know. Wow, Ballard's diet wasn't in it. Uh, he had five a day, but it was always bananas. <laughs> so he sits down, he's looking really quite cheerful and happy. I said, oh, you look cheerful, Tony. Everything going well? He said, oh, yeah, I've just had a death oh, threat. Yeah. It shows I'm still relevant. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I do wonder with all that pressure that if, it, in a way, families and feel it and friends feel it more i think if you're in the in the fray yeah you know you've got you're, to do it you're so right you're so you know, i grew up with that <clears throat> with hit around yeah. him and i think it was very threatening because i was i was yeah. young and yeah. you're not you're not the agent of it all that's Correct. just it's just no, an observation that's so right the the people around you suffer more than you do yeah i mean i, you I do suffer. have a voice yeah. i can speak out yeah. i'll get the opportunity to speak out Lara, my wife, yeah. my sons and so yeah. on, all suffer yeah. a great deal yeah. of the abuse and the threatening behaviour of the media towards yeah. us uh, and all of that. And my office staff and so on do, do suffer. And I, you know, I want to say a huge thank you to all of those that have worked with me and all of my family for what they put up with. Because mm. mm. they put up with an awful lot. Yeah. And um, always been incredibly loyal and incredibly defensive of me, even when they didn't agree with what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, but there's a kind of support that family gives a loved family member. They might disagree passionately, but in the end, it's like... Yeah, that's and right. they see also what's, what's happening. But you do have to be prepared to argue your case. I mean, the Iraq war was preceded by the Gulf War in 91, which mm. was a... Um, we were in a very small minority in opposition to the Gulf War. I think there was only 15 or 16 MPs that voted on a procedural motion against it. And then when the Iraq War came, uh, well, Afghanistan came in 2001, 
which was, again, a relatively small number that were against the invasion of Afghanistan, not because we approved of 9-11 and the attack on the World Trade Center, quite the opposite. It was just saying, well, actually, where's the logic of yeah. invading Afghanistan because there's been an attack on the World Trade Center? It, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, a few people in the U.S. also felt that, particularly Barbara Lee. Um, then the Iraq War and the build-up to it, Opposition to the Iraq war was significant from early on. Alice Mann, the late great Alice Mann, started the thing with an EDM about weapons of mass destruction, early day motion, a year before, almost a year before. And she was right. And that grew in support. We'd already formed the Stop the War Coalition. Yeah. And so the debate was intense, but there was always a significant body who were of people who were opposed to it. I remember a meeting with Tony Blair, um, would have been 2003, probably around the time of the big demonstration which they tried to prevent happening. But anyway, I'll come back to that. And so we had this meeting with Tony Blair, a whole lot of us, all of whom were, were sceptics or passionately opposed to the Iraq war. And everybody's asking questions and Tony is vaguely answering them. And at the end of it, he said, OK, one more question, I've got to go. I said, so it was my, I was the only one who hadn't asked a question at that point, so it had to be me. So I asked a question. I said, Tony, why are we doing this? We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And then got up and walked out. Mm. That was the best he could do. Yeah. And uh, that. But he point, must have known he couldn't change the mind of U15. I mean, you weren't like those MPs that were oh, wobbling. Yeah. On the day in question, when the vote took place in Parliament, um, Blair and Campbell and everybody were hauling Labour MPs in all day long, threatening them with everything they could think of. And there was almost a queue of Labour MPs waiting to go in and be chastised by Blair and company. So I went and joined the queue. And they said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I want to persuade the Prime Minister of the error of his ways. What? <laughs> They said, well, you're not going to change your mind, are you? I said, no. They let you in? No, they said, well, why don't you just go away? <laughs> <laughs> I just went there to annoy them, really. Mm. I mean, you have to have a sense of humour sometimes, don't you? So, so I think it kind of helps, doesn't it? I think people would like to know, what's it like speaking in the House of Commons? Did you, first time, what was it like? Mm. Do you come to like it, or is it... I think some people enjoy it, other people... No, I've never liked it. Never liked it. No. I, the first uh, speech I made was um, in the summer of 1983. And, um, Your maiden speech. Your maiden speech, yeah. It's a terrible word for it, but yeah. Yeah. First speech, better way of putting it. I um, described my constituency and the issues surrounding it and poverty levels and how different it was from the atmosphere in Parliament and so on. And I can stand by every word that's in that yeah. speech and still yeah. do. Um, I find it a club, often a lot of time wasting. It was more pompous then than it is now. It's less pompous now. Less pompous now. And it, Would you ever say you've come to love, I mean, it sounds crazy to ask you, uh, come to love your parliamentary life in any way, or is it just something? It's part of the job. It's part of the job. I, no, I don't particularly enjoy um, the parliament, the atmosphere, or the company, or the building. Um, I remember I used to talk to your dad a lot about this and about the significance of, of a British constitutional arrangements, power of the House of Commons, limited power of the House of Commons in many ways. And I supported him with his Commonwealth of Britain bill. Mm. Um, I think he loved the place more than I did. Yeah. He actually quite enjoyed a lot of it. Yeah. And he was incredibly knowledgeable about it. But um, do I like love the place? No. I, I would rather we had a more efficient more modern legislature and uh, I, I've come round to the view that the idea of spending well probably over a billion pounds on refurbishing the building we ought to be instead building a new parliament building somewhere yeah, else. There's so much and resistance to that isn't it? Keep there? the building because yeah. it is a beautiful building yeah. um, as um, a museum or whatever else an art gallery because I mean there's phenomenal history and yeah. wonder to it but yeah. as an efficient building it's not. But I mean, but most MPs are so attached to it, and the sort of clubby 
the what remains the clubby atmosphere. But oh, let they, me they ask, love it. Yeah, yeah, let me ask you about some of the people you've met there because you've talked to me a bit about that. I mean, great figures come to Parliament. You're very interested in global politics. You must have met some great figures oh, when yeah. they were there. <clears throat> some of them are very funny as well and could be very interesting. Um, I politically didn't agree with Dennis Healy on either economic or international affairs. Um, but Dennis had a phenomenal knowledge and could be quite interesting to talk to. So he and I would often talk a, a lot. He'd say, oh, hello, Jeremy, how's the revolution going? It was that sort of quite irritating way he had of doing things. But he could be very knowledgeable. But he would also listen. And he knew that I'd been involved in, um, in Central America in essentially supporting what the Sandinistas were trying to do from 79 onwards. And he said, explain me what's going on. So I did. I talked to him about it. So he was actually open to listening to people in a way that uh, many of his um, successors, who probably had the same kind of politics in, were simply not prepared to open with people at all. Yeah. Um, he could also be very funny. I remember he came back from the uh, funeral of... Um, Brezhnev in, in Moscow and he comes back and I said uh, what was it like then a funeral he said well what do you think of funerals like in Moscow in January <laughs> I said cold he said yep very very cold I said what about a successor he said well we were standing around Brezhnev's coffin and I looked up at Andropov I thought Brezhnev looked healthy <laughs> <laughs> it was a great <laughs> sense of humor. So I kind of enjoyed him. Tam Diel was also a great friend of mine who would, um, and we worked together on issues surrounding the rights of the Chagos Islanders. So he'd be a good one uh, to. What about to, figures from abroad, though, foreign leaders? I mean, Mandela, you met. Yeah. Um, I met um, many who, uh, people who've come in um, visiting from different parts of the world and. Um, Mandela was a, a case in point that was uh, amazing, really. He came fairly shortly after he'd been released. Uh, he went to Cuba first, and then I think he went to somewhere in Europe, and he came to Britain. And he had a, a meeting for him in the Grand Committee Room in Westminster Hall. And he spoke, um, and his team were there, and he took questions and so on. And after about half an hour, the meeting room started to empty as MPs, because their attention spans are very small, started disappearing. And his um, team that with him, had a small team with him, they said, Nelson, it's OK to go now with meeting sort of finished. He said, no, no, if there's people who've got questions, I'll stay and answer them. So it ended up with Tony and me and Mandela. So we sat around a table together, just the three of us, um, and Tony was asking Nelson about public ownership, which was actually a more prescient question than it seemed at the time. Mm. I, mean, I thought, wow, that's a bit weird. I, I thought, so I looked at Tony, oh, why? And it, of course, it was pretty fundamental to the later ANC economic strategy. So Tony was really onto something there. So we're having this very friendly discussion, and Tony's writing it all down in pencil. On, on an old paper and so on. And he taking his jacket with braces and writing it down. And so as he's got his head down writing, Mandela looks at me. What's he doing? What's he do? Who is this guy? What's he doing? I said, it's for his diaries. He said, oh, OK. It's a bit like your prison diaries. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony probably never realised this sort of... Um, I found extraordinary is that more MPs didn't want to stay behind and talk to Mandela. I mean, that, that's what I find incredible. No, but when he came as president, oh. they were all there. Oh, right, OK. And they all queued up, and the speeches were quite extraordinary. I mean, you would have thought every last one of them had been passionately involved in the anti-apartheid yeah, movement yeah. from 1960 onwards. Yeah. No. Yeah. The anti-apartheid movement was a very small minority yeah. group yeah. for a very long time. And anyone involved in it got an amazing amount of abuse. And I remember to doing stuff against apartheid in Shropshire, Stop the 70 Tour. 
and getting lots of um, abusive stuff in the local papers about what I was doing. You know, how does all this affect you in the constituency? Do you feel it's a place where you're, you're obviously known very well, have tremendous connections, but has there been, have you felt sometimes, um, has it been difficult in the constituency? Or? Gillespie Park, just across the road, was due to be a, a lorry park distribution centre, former railway sidings. We won that for an ecological park, and it's now a lovely park. And I'm very proud of that. And so you win campaigns, and people winning campaigns opens their eyes of what they can achieve. And so it is about empowering and mobilising people. And uh, I've uh, always tried to work with the local community organisations and groups, the faith communities, uh, and all of that in order to achieve things. And defending our wonderful wonderful local hospital, the Whittington Hospital. It has the joy of being a middle-sized hospital. It has the disadvantage of being a middle-sized hospital because it's in danger of becoming a walk-in health centre or um, closed down altogether. They came after it, the health authorities, and tried to close the accident emergency department. And I only found out about that because they mistakenly included me in an email chain to my private email of the plan to close the A&E department. I thought, what? So I'm looking at this email. So I didn't respond and didn't reply because I wanted to see what else came because I was obviously on an email tree I shouldn't have been on. So I built up this whole stuff and then revealed it to the public. Yeah. They were planning to close the A&E department. And um, we mounted a massive campaign. We had 5,000 people walking along the Holloway Road and we won. You and Tony got up to some slightly unorthodox things when you were in Parliament. Emily Wilding Davidson, tell me. Well, uh, Tony had this um, idea that we should be commemorating uh, rebels and um, so on that had changed the course of history. And um, he, he then said to me about Emily Wilding Davidson hiding in the broom cupboard in the crypt by the um, St Mary Undercroft, the chapel. I said, OK. And... He said, well, I think we should put a plaque up to her in, in the broom cupboard. I said, well, good luck with that. They're never, <laughs> they're never going to agree to that. He said, no, I don't think they will. Um, because, you know, the house authority are kind of defacing the building or something. Mm. So he said, why don't we put it up ourselves? I said, yeah, OK. Great. OK. He said, can you help me put it up? I said, sure, of course. So um, he then brought an excessive number of tools to put up this plaque. I don't know why he brought so many tools. He's a bit of a DIY fanatic. But never mind. Yeah. He brought more than was strictly necessary. And so I'm, I'm carrying this bag and this police officer arrives. I thought, oh God, you know. How are we going to explain what we're doing walking through Parliament late at night when it's almost deserted, carrying a bag of tools, including an electric drill? So the police officer comes out and says, Good evening, gentlemen. I said, Good evening, how are you? He said, I said, Would you like me to help you carry your heavy bag? I said, No, no, it's, it's fine, thanks. <laughs> it's fine. I'm, I'm quite happy with the bag. It's not heavy at all. So we, and then he walked, this policeman walked with us for a while. And um, I said, um, you're going home? And Tony said, no, 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 we're going to the chapel. <laughs> the police officer looks at us. OK. Uh, Tony said, we just need a bit of solitude to think things through. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was more credible coming from Tony yeah. than me because he did have... Um, a, a kind of um, respect for faith and, and so on. Well, I've got respect for faith, but yeah. he was sort of more obvious in his case, should we say. So he's, oh, yeah, it's a wonderful place to go late at night. Would you like me to come with you? Oh, God. <laughs> I said, no, no, it's, it's OK, thanks. We'll be, we'll be fine. I think we just need a bit of solitude. <laughs> so he then calls an attendant over who gets the key and opens the door and then decides to come down the steps into the chapel with us. So I was still carrying this bag of tools. Well, you, you've got you carrying the tools. I'm still carrying the tools, carrying yeah. The I'm carrying the tools, drill. not yeah. Tony. I don't know. I'm like the, you know, the guy behind with the tools. So this guy comes down into the chapel with us. 
How are we going to get rid of him? And so he gets down there. He says, I'll put all the lights on for you, gentlemen, so that you can see the beauty of the chapel while you're having your quiet time. This is like, we're coming up towards midnight now. I don't know why he didn't think there was something a little odd about this. So eventually we persuaded him to go without telling him to go, if you know what I mean. So he went. So we then go and open up the broom cupboard and um, move all the stuff out of the way. And Tony gets the plaque out and we drill a hole in the door and all the rest of it. And I'm with the electric. How long did it take? Not long. Yeah. Not, not, Not that long. So we then um, put the uh, put the plaque up, put all the stuff back, like nothing had happened, and then leave, go and turn off the lights, plants, and go. Take the tools back to Tony's car. He goes up. So he gets up next day with a point of order, saying he's put this plaque up in the room. <laughs> Big fuss about it. Yeah. You know, who are these people destroying, defiling Parliament? Blah, blah, blah. And now there's a whole big feature about it. And there's a brass plaque, which we'd put up, which is now cleaned, it was always cleaned by the cleaners, polished as brass. Yeah. We had the picture and the brass plaque. And, um, and Tony said, and her, by her bravery, Emily Wilder Davison, of course, was died under the king's mm. horse in the derby. Um, such uh, achievements as votes of women were won. And... Uh, it was a very good way of drawing attention to the bravery of people like her and um, Sylvia Pankhurst and so many others. And my local connection with this is that Sylvia Pankhurst was the most regular visitor to HMP Holloway. And she was in there, I think, 26 times in her life for being one of the suffragettes mobilizing working class women in East London and also, she was in, in prison for sedition when she spoke to a group of soldiers in Nottingham during the First World War, saying we shouldn't be killing working class Germans any more than they should be killing us. Um, and um, it's that bits of history that are so important. And at the same time, I always say this quiz question, who was the first woman elected to Parliament? Yeah. Constance. It was not Nancy Astor, yeah. it was Connie Markovitz, yeah. who was elected from Holloway Prison, mm. 1918, Dublin Central, Sinn Féin. And um, so we've got um, a new housing development replacing the prison, and I'm determined to make sure that Sylvia Pankhurst and Connie Markovitz are commemorated in that. But we've well, also. What might be named after yeah, them? Yeah. Something will be yeah. named after them. There. Yeah. And there's going to be a women's centre, which I think should be named after one or both of them. Um, but we've do- there's a sense of humour locally, which is wonderful. There's a library was rebuilt uh, next to HMP Holloway, and it's called the Cat and Mouse Library. Really? After, After that the, act? The Cat yeah. and Mouse Act, yeah. So it is about popularising radical history, and this is something that um, I believe very strongly in, about music, theatre and art. It empowers people. Yeah. Because our history teaching in schools often disempowers. Mm -hmm. We're told the rich, the powerful, the famous, the personalities, they're the ones that rule the world. No, Mm -hmm. they don't. It's the power of the common people. Perfect time to say, we're sitting here in New Beacon Books. Tell us about your connection to it. New Beacon Books was founded by John LaRose and others in 1966 um, at the time of uh, unbelievable levels of racism against the Afro-Caribbean community, particularly the Caribbean community, when the pubs, no blacks, no Irish, Mm. and so on, Uh, could go in the the pubs. And um, this bookshop was opened as a way of empowering people. John LaRose, wonderful poet, set up New Beacon Books uh, with also the George Padmore Institute. George Padmore was a wonderful campaigner who um, was um, ended up working as an advisor to um, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. And this bookshop became the center of Caribbean resistance to racism in society, supported the Nautical Carnival, which was in its infancy then, and also very interesting um, educational campaign, which your mother would have been totally, I'm sure she was in support of it at the time anyway, would have been totally appreciative of, was against the banding system in education in Haringey, which was um, essentially banding kids on abilities and streaming them in secondary schools. And um, it was black kids who were in the lowest band. 
and it was basically cultural assessments of men. It was a disgusting policy. And it was the influence of John and others, and Bernard Cord, later of Grenada, who was here, um, and um, Morris Bishop, who was also here, the campaign on it. And so by the time I became a Haringey councillor in 1974, the banding system had already been ended, but there were still issues surrounding it. And so that was only achieved because of work in this bookshop by those people. And that, think of the significant difference that would have made to the lives of a lot of young black people in Haringey as a result of what happened in this bookshop. So, Jeremy, 40 years an MP, congratulations Thank on you. that. And being, an, I think, assiduous is the good, you know, really hard-working committed MP, what do you want to see next? Social justice in this country and a peaceful world and I will carry on campaigning for all of that, for decency, respect and social justice in our world and our society. And, and Islington North. And in the lovely Islington North. I love the community and love the place and I'm very happy here. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>